Welcome to the Legends Behind the Craft podcast, where we feature top leaders in the wine and craft beverage industry with your host, Drew Hendricks. Now, let's get started with the show. Drew Thomas Hendricks here. I'm the host of the Legends Behind the Craft podcast. On this show, I talk with leaders in the wine and craft beverage industry. Today, we've got a veteran of the cork industry on the show. But before I formally introduce him, I've got to do the sponsor message. Today's episode, sponsored by Barrels Ahead. Barrels Ahead, we work with you to implement a one-of-a-kind marketing strategy. One that highlights your authenticity, tells your story, and connects you with your ideal customers. In short, we help wineries and craft beverage producers unlock their story to unleash their revenue. Go to BarrelsAhead.com today to learn more. Today, I'm super excited to talk with Dustin Moe. Dustin's the president and CEO of Portacork. Welcome to the show, Dustin. Thanks for having me. Happy to oh, be thanks. here. Oh, thanks for being on. So, Dustin, 22 years or 20 some odd years in the cork industry. Yeah, yeah, it's been a fun ride. <laughs> how did, how did you get started? I think such a, a lot of times people uh, are surprised. Uh, you know, I've been the company I'm at uh, going on, I think, 20, 21 years, something like that. And, uh, and yeah, longevity in this business is uh, usually uh, not always seen, but been happy where I'm at. It's been a good ride. Oh, that's fantastic. How did you, how did you get started in the industry? With corks, yeah, yeah. So really, kind of a crazy story. I um, I met a guy socially, and uh, you know, just I was yeah. I just uh, moved to the area, uh, had just a job that was kind of providing food on the table, kind of thing, and uh, always had you know kind of a knack for sales. And um, uh, I talked to this guy and, and asked him what he did, and he said he sold cork. And I kind of made a joke. I said that's like saying you sell shoestrings, and. <laughs> We both laughed and he said, you know, well, the guy that sells the shoe strings on your shoes probably makes a good living. And it resonated with me. And I, I, uh, I, you know, I always, I wanted to get in the wine business. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, within a couple of weeks, uh, I had been perusing the local Napa register. You didn't have much internet back then. And Mm -hmm. I saw an advertisement for a cork salesman. So I called the guy, um, just out of the blue and said, Hey, can I, you know, buy you a beer or coffee and pick your brain about cork? Cause I have this interview. And, so I went and I met up with him that evening and he told me, uh, ironically, his company was hiring and, you know, I, I ended up uh, meeting his owner and, you know, few within a few weeks, I was uh, working with him as a colleague. So uh, very, very kind of funny way. And so I started out in, in sales. Start off in, so selling corks, like when you're going into accounts, like what, what do wineries look for when they're choosing you know, between a cork provider? Sure. Yeah. So, so we, um, I mean, it's very interesting in that, you know, the cork is kind of the final guardian of the wine, you know, Mm -hmm. you, you have, uh, the bottle, but you have the cork. And so cork has been a a product that has given fits to, to wineries and consumers, you know, for a lot of years. And, um, so, you know, typical sale, our customer would be, you know, a winemaker or an assistant winemaker or a bigger wineries procurement manager. And, um, you know, you're just going in and you're talking about the merits of your product and your your company and so forth. And when I first got into it, there's probably, you know, 25 uh, competitors. And, um, you know, in the early 2000s, you know, the, the alternative closures kind of came on the scene and mm-hmm. it really forced uh, the industry to have to clean up its act. And so a lot of wine, a lot of uh, suppliers went uh, to the wayside and um, and, you know, sort of the cream. Uh, rose to the top and people had to invest in, in research and development and, and building new, you know, processes and uh, technology in order to, to make cork cleaner. Yeah. Now talk to me about some of the innovations because you don't really think of, you think of cork being such a natural um, off the tree and into the bottle. What, what sort of innovations have happened over the last 20 years in your tenor? Sure, sure. Yeah. Well, so, you know, back in the day, it's funny in that, you know, it was a very archaic industry. You know, when I first, the very first time I ever stepped foot in Europe uh, and went to a cork factory, there was dirt floors and, you know, you had people with sandals and cigarettes hanging out of their mouth. Uh, And so it's, and and I'm, I'm being honest. And so, you know, you, uh, you go today and it's like going to a Toyota factory. I mean, all robotics and high tech equipment and, you know, that sort of thing. So, so it really has changed a lot. But back in the day, you know, it was like a unique selling point, as you said, you know, um, you know, the cork when you take it from the tree, it needs to season for a certain period and then you, you boil it. And uh, back in the day, it was like, oh, well, our factory, we change the boiling water every two weeks. 
you know, and that was a selling point. <laughs> so, and that water was so nasty. But uh, but then, you know, you look at uh, today, I mean, you have continuous filtrations of the bath water, you have uh, different types of eradication methods that uh, you employ in order to be able to either eradicate the TCA or any other, you know, volatile organic compound that, that could potentially affect the flavors of wine. Yeah, I would th- see, yeah, because back in the day, like I started selling wine in the early 90s. And okay. different regions had different, you know, there was, there were some regions and I'm just going to call it Burgundy. If you're, we're buying Burgundy in the early nineties, at least one out of every bottle was one out of every bottle in the case was cork. I and mean, we didn't see that in, in the U S and that's mm-hmm. greatly decreased as far as what I've anecdotally, what I've seen. Yeah. In the U S really what has happened. I mean, we, the U S has been kind of a, a leader in, in pushing the industry forward and, and being very, uh, uh, demanding. And so, um, you know, with the U S kind of, uh, in 19, I want to say it was in 1998 or 99, the, a bunch of cork suppliers got together and formed a cork quality council. And mm. uh, what, what it did was it set standards for cork that was entering the U S market. And it was by listening to the customers and the customers were like, this stuff that we're getting is not acceptable. And if you don't change, we're going to go to alternatives. Mm-hmm. And so it really, you know, forced the industry to, to make many changes. And as I said, I mean, you know, we started, I think with eight members of that uh, organization of which three maybe, yeah, I think three are no longer around. So it's, you know, I mean, it, it, the, 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 real issues that have plagued our industry through those those years you're speaking of are, are not there today mm-hmm. um there's different products at various price points for various wines that you know we, we have products that we can guarantee each and every cork is is free of detectable tca or off uh off flavor uh type uh, uh compounds so so we have you know uh, uh products in the arsenal today to kind of meet every price point of wine so not uh, not so much spoke up today, but it took many years, and it took yeah. us uh, getting beat up a little bit by some alternatives. And I can see I can see that it's, it was more the um, very traditional regions back in the day that you saw the more corked, and that would entirely correlate with some of the rustic conditions of the um, production shops back then. Yeah, yeah. And, then, and I can't imagine like with the technology being able to identify, like basically analyze every single cork. Like if you've got a wine at you know nine hundred dollars a bottle, it's worth it to yeah, for sure. Yeah. Buy that. How does that work? Is it like a spectrometer? Or? Yeah. So we have we have a couple of different things. So we have um, essentially like you take a natural cork and and you punch it out of the bark of a tree, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, so you're left with leftovers, and and essentially it looks you know a strip after you're done uh, punching it looks a bit like uh, Swiss cheese. You have the cylinders that are punched out of it. Uh-huh. So we take that leftover and we uh, grind that, and then we do make a reconstituted cork. Um, it's called a microagglomerated cork, and mm-hmm. those corks are are 100% guaranteed to be free of TCA because once you break them down into the small particulate, you can uh, remove uh, any you know uh, volatile organic compound. When it's a full size punched cork, if you utilize the same technology, uh, it would destroy the cork. Yeah, and so. What we had to do was then go to uh, other technologies that cleaned it considerably, mm-hmm. uh, but then an, an analysis, which is a cork by cork uh, analysis. So, you know, the the microagglomerated corks are kind of more for the uh, the you know premium to popular premium and below price segment, mm-hmm. and the corks that then get analyzed uh, individually. That's going to be for your more ultra premium and luxury segment. So, yeah, it's kind of how how we uh how our products are segmented yeah talk to me about your segmentation and your different like the, the port of cork your product line from the icon mm-hmm. down to premium and performance yeah yeah so so basically what we do is it's very typical to propose a product based upon the price point of a wine so if you have a wine that's going to be you know above 75 bucks uh typically you're going to be if it's a red wine, it's going to be utilizing a, a, a two inch cork or 49 millimeter. Uh, it's referred to as both. Mm-hmm. Um, if it's a, you know, a, a burgundy bottle or, or a white wine, typically it'd be an inch and three quarter or 45 millimeter. And, you know, it's you, based on that price point, we propose a product and, and, and you have various grades. We have nine grades, uh, with oh. every uh, size. Mm-hmm. And typically in the U.S., um, there we're selling like the top four grades. 
Mm -hmm. uh, but there are nine grades in total uh, from uh, from every you know every time you're punching cork, you you have nine grades. So, so yeah, so we have customers. Uh, I mean, you know, for instance, we have uh, you know Isley Vineyards or Screaming Eagle or some of these guys. I mean, they're paying you know over two dollars a cork. It's the very very absolute best money can buy. Mm -hmm. um, lithology winery, for instance, San Lina. I mean, these guys, they don't care. They want the absolute yeah. best. And, uh, and so you could sell a cork uh, at $2 or above. Then again, you can, uh, sell a cork to, uh, one of the multinationals, uh, that's a micro agglomerated cork for, you know, less than, than seven cents a piece. Mm -hmm. So you kind of cover that full gamut, uh, of from, from the north of $2 to, to that's, you know, seven cents, uh, can be very typical. So it really kind of depends on the price point of the wines. It's just that, yeah, you can, you can definitely, you can, you have a $2 cork in your hand. You, you can tell. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it makes a nice statement. Yeah. And that's part of, that's part of the thing about natural corks is when you pull that cork out of the bottle, there's something about that whole experience of it. Mm -hmm. that really allows is on one level allowing you to compete, but how, how have you address or how has Porta Cork addressed all the alternative closures and remaining competitive over the years? Sure. I mean, we, we've had uh, difficulty primarily when we've been faced with uh, a huge exchange, exchange rate, you know, uh, uh, deficit. So, you know, really like when we're, I've sold, you know, I've been doing this a long time. So I've been trying to sell a, a European based product or European manufactured product, um, when we've had, you know, the euro to dollar at 160, um, uh -huh. you know, it's pretty difficult, uh, to compete with, uh, for instance, synthetics that are made in North Carolina. Sure. Um, so, or screw caps that are made in the Modesto. So, mm -hmm. so during those periods, it, it's, uh, created some, some difficulty in the premium or the popular premium and, and value segment. Um, but, you know, in terms of, uh, of, you know, just, uh, how, you know, with the alternatives, how, how, how it's sort of transpired is, you know, you have, uh, back in the early nineties, the very first synthetic came on the market, mm -hmm. 1992 or 93, I think it was. They didn't really start making any noise until the late nineties. Then the, the industry, which is primarily based in Portugal said, Oh my gosh, we need to respond. Mm -hmm. Uh, we need to really fix our, our product here. Until then, we had no, no, no reason to, to clean up our act. And in the early 2000s, they started investing a lot in, 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 you know, factories and technology. We had a brand new factory we, we built in the south of Portugal in 2001. Another one in the south of Portugal in a different forested area in 2003, I believe. Um, and then continued to, to progress and move the industry forward from there. So by the time we got to about, uh, you know, 2010, Mm -hmm. uh, cork had shrunk down to perhaps uh, as low as a 60% market share from 100. Oh, wow. Now, most of that market share had been eaten up by synthetics, but some of that market share had been eaten up, eaten up by uh, by screw caps. Mm -hmm. And I'm speaking of, of you know, the global market. And if you look at where cork stands today, so that's 2010. And I'll give you another uh, 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 number to, to think about. In 2010, if you looked at the top 30 wineries in the U.S., I think it's like uh, 19 of them were using synthetic stoppers. So when I say the top 30, that's by by volume, your largest uh, wineries in the U.S. They were using synthetic. Mm -hmm. Today, you literally have three. So, wow. so really, you have synthetic was was ch chipping away at us. Mm -hmm. But as the industry responded, and we showed that cork can can seal a bottle of wine and can be competitive from a cost perspective. Uh, we were able to really gain a lot of that market share back. However, some of the market share that synthetics had, had taken had then drifted over to screw cap. Uh -huh. So today you kind of have the real vast majority of the market is cork and screw cap. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I would say synthetic still has some visibility because of a few very large wineries. I mean, Gallo, uh, uh, is still using some, is still using synthetic. Uh, and you have a couple of others, uh, Sutter Home, for instance. So. You know, I think uh, that's still known as doing some volume, but in terms mm -hmm. of wineries, it's it's very very low. Yeah, I would, yeah, I didn't really think about that, but it it would make sense that um, synthetics would lose the market to the screw caps because mm -hmm. you're at that kind of price point, you just want the bottle open. Yes, exactly. Yeah, and but I think that as the so as I I went I kind of skipped over the exchange rate thing. So the exchange rate was as high as one sixty to the dollar or yeah dollar sixty to the euro. I mean. 
And uh, once we got back down into that, you know, 120 range, which had hovered for a long time between 110 and 125, let's say, mm -hmm. uh, we were able to be then competitive with synthetic. And we started really clawing back and, and, and driving customers back to cork by showing a product that performed and didn't give TCA uh, uh, issues or cork tain issues and was cost competitive. And so as we've continued to move forward, and, uh, and, you know, as factories become more automated and so on, we've been able to, to have a lot of efficiency. And, and, uh, so today we're cost competitive, uh, no problem. We have a product that goes head to head with synthetic and then, you know, are there on up. Synthetic is the cheapest right now. People buy synthetic because of cost. Yeah. You're talking about the, 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 the dollar and we're recording this episode in late September. And right now the dollar is historically strong against the euro yeah. is the How's that affecting? Is it the good times or is it more of the scary times that you want it just to equalize? Yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, it's good right now, but we've had some historic uh, cost increases across the board, just as everybody knows. We speak of when you turn on the news, that's all you hear about is the inflation. You hear yeah. about the, how we're, we're in a recession, although some times the government doesn't want to acknowledge it being a full-blown recession uh, and so forth. So we have been um, hit with the astronomical cost increases from packaging to transportation. Um, we used to, in 2020, we were paying about 3,500 euros for a container to get from the door of our factory in Portugal to the door of our factory here in Napa. Mm -hmm. And today that cost is 15,000. Oh. And it's unbelievable. So, uh, and, and, uh, and I'll give you another statistic is, is in 20, 2020, it was taking on average 47 days. And mm -hmm. in 2022, it's taking on average 112. Isn't that amazing? So, so well, yeah, so so any good. benefits from the strong dollar are definitely offset by yeah. the current. Yeah. And then we're also tied to the cost of our raw material. And if we have, if we happen to have a, uh, uh, you know, a year where the yield is maybe not quite as strong as some other years, we harvest the cork on a nine year cycle. And so we kind of know and can prepare some. But for instance, in, uh, in 2022, the harvest, uh, that we had, uh, had about a 20% premium, uh, attached to it. So between all of the cost increases, the inflationary increases, um, and you know transport and 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 all that it was just pretty much and the, and then you know offset with the the uh the the euro to dollar mm -hmm. uh it we're still in a negative position so uh so yeah prices are, are are having to go up are you seeing the um supply increase like are the the delivery times contract a little bit now or is it still just clogged up at 120 still, yeah still pretty bad um you know we receive anywhere from 7 to 15 containers a week and, uh, you know, so we have a pretty good understanding as to what's happening at the port mm -hmm. and, you know, we'll get a surprise and we'll get all of a sudden one that shows up at 72 days. But mm -hmm. the averaging right now is I think we're at 112 days when we used to average 47. So heavy congestion at the port. We, we went to some alternative ports. We start shipping into the East coast as well as Houston. Oh, okay. And then and then trucking it across but everybody did the same thing so yeah. yesterday in the news they talked about you know new york being uh totally congested and the world's largest you know or the the busiest port at the moment so pretty uh pretty messy situation on the supply chain side for sure yeah, yeah. and i gotta say you're one of the first people i'd be able to talk about it usually <laughs> i love it thank you usually at the in the pre-show for everybody that's listening, he's like, is there anything you don't want to talk about? And yeah. pretty much that's what comes up all the time. Just don't mention supply chain. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. Well, you know, I've been, I've been, uh, uh, you know, dealing with it for, for several you know months now. And we're, you know, it, as I said, I mean, just in 2022, we were, you know, having 47 days and 3,500, yeah. 3,500 years of container. And now to be sitting at 112 and, 15,000 is a, is a, yeah, it's a, it's a really difficult situation. Yeah. How, so, um, how are you overcoming this? Like, is it just constant adaptability, streamlining operations? Yeah. You know, really what we've had to do, um, is essentially it's just cost us a lot more. We, we have, I would normally have in transit at any one time, um, you know, let me back up. We work in, in our Napa office. Uh, we work on a rotation of about every 90 day stock. 
Mm-hmm. Well, if you're not getting stock, you know, on a consistent basis, what are you doing? You're going to go ahead and, you know, put enough in transit to get you, you know, to, 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 to kind of buffer that those, you know, long windows of when you'll receive things and so on. So, I mean, let's say I used to have uh, at any one time between the door of Portugal and my door, maybe $10 million in, in inventory. I mean, that number's, you know, doubled. Um, huh. So we're having to just send a lot more product out just huh. uh, uh, to kind of, you know, uh, to kind of offset, you know, the timing huh. of when it's going to arrive. Absolutely. Well, let's, let's talk about the product for the second and specifically sustainability. I mean, it was it, few people, I think people realize it's a natural product, but I think few people realize it's maybe one of the most sustainable aspects of wine production. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, um, you know, it's the, one of the beautiful products of cork is, is that, you know, it's, we don't cut down the tree. So a lot of people don't even realize that, but you, uh, it's a very particular type of, uh, of oak that, um, thrives once you uh, strip the bark. So you have, um, this, you know, oak species that's very uh, common near the Mediterranean region of, uh, mm-hmm. Europe. So you have some in North Africa. You have uh, uh, Portugal, Spain, a little bit in uh, South France, uh, Sardinia, um, mm. and and basically you you strip the bark uh, of the tree and then it just regenerates. It's every nine years, so it's a little bit like us uh, clipping our fingernails, mm-hmm. um, and it just keeps regrowing. So we don't so cut down like the wool. tree. What's that? Like wool, you got your the sheep exactly, exactly, yeah. <laughs> So we and we actually have uh, some statistic. We've we've heard that you know it's like a cork tree that has its uh, bark stripped every nine years in the normal cycle will will outlive one that never has its bark stripped, you know, by fifty years or so. Um, so it's actually a good you know healthy uh, thing to have the the bark stripped every nine years. But we so we we strip the bark, uh, then uh, then we. Um, yeah, you know, we make products out of it. There's not one thing of that bark that does not get used, whether it be for a high quality stopper and then the leftovers being ground to then make a composite stopper or microagglomerate work, uh, where then leftovers of that process we use to burn to create energy for our plants. We're, uh, we're over 70% uh, self uh, sustained in terms of our energy usage. Uh, and that has a lot to do with it. Um, and then just all the different byproducts. So we have, you know, cork that we use for automotive industries, for, uh, for wall and uh, insulation, uh, type products for flooring. flooring I'm standing thing. on a cork floor right now. Nice. Yeah. We okay. have a cork floor in my office. I love yeah. it. It's a nice soft springiness to it. It has a nice springiness to it. And then also it has some really good uh, acoustic properties. So we're, we've uh, had the company, which, you know, I'm not responsible for the flooring division, but we work very closely and they, uh, they, you know, do a lot in the, um, you know, any acoustic, acoustic spaces, whether it be, you know, music halls or, or oh, that yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. It does have that insulation and it's always warm. Yeah. Exactly. Well, it's not, it's not hot, but I mean, we, on a cold day, you walk in the room and it's comforting. And yes. Uh, be on like a, on a hot day it, it doesn't it, i don't know there's something about it i love it yeah you know our our uh people over in portugal they had this bright idea of thinking of the the cooling effect um is they said you know have you of course you probably know that in europe uh, soccer is incredibly popular mm-hmm. and they uh these soccer stadiums have artificial turf and then what they put on the art- artificial turf is they always have these little beads of uh, rubber um oh. that are laid across the turf and um, create that little bit more of that springiness uh, for, con- for uh, you know, when, when guys are tackled or fall to the ground, whatever. Mm-hmm. And so they had this idea, they said, why don't we use cork? Mm. And they did some experimentation and they said, you know, this, this is absolutely fantastic because not only does it create the springiness, it also has this cooling effect. So if you go to a soccer stadium or you go to an artificial turf field, that is, you know, on a day of a hundred degrees, mm-hmm. uh, you, you, the temperature at the surface is, is actually like 120. Yeah. Well, the one with cork on it was like 105 or 103. Really? So significantly cooler than the one with the, yeah, the rubber, uh, pellets. So they started promoting the heck out of this and they started filling these, uh, these, uh, soccer fields and different, different stadiums, uh, with, uh, this, uh, cork granulate. Everything was great until the first rains. 
and oh. all the quotes floated up. <laughs> no, <laughs> I didn't think about that. So, yeah, so we've had to make uh, some uh, engineering uh, uh, changes to the cork, and now cork is actually, a, I just say because it it's really funny, um, but uh, it, they are using a lot of cork for it now, and it's not floating, so uh, they just had to create, you know, some uh, some some different products to be able to add to the granules. But uh, yeah, yeah, you, I, so you it know, has a very good cooling effect. It does. It does. I can I can testify to that on the warm days. Now I you, you really don't think of all the different uses for it, but the one thing you always think about, and you mentioned that cork trees are grown in other countries. Is there a reason we don't see a lot of cork from other countries? It's just that Portugal has the monopoly on it? That's a great question. So uh, it's not that they have the monopoly. It's uh, that that is the country where you have the vast majority of the thick wood. And mm -hmm. so you have to have, um, and the cork has to be of a certain thickness in order to be able to punch a stopper. And um, then also you have um, the climatic changes of how the cork grows. So for instance, in the North African countries, there's plenty of cork. We have some factories down there, mm -hmm. but none of the cork that comes from the North African countries is of a good enough quality that actually is able to be able to make a stopper out of. That's where we get a lot of our insulation, our flooring and our composites uh, type cork. So it's very thin wood. It doesn't ever get reach the thickness that it re reaches in Portugal. Then you have countries like Sardinia, and uh, Sardinia has very dense cork. It's it's a little harder. It's very dense. Uh, Sardinia cork usually is quite beautiful, but Sardinian cork is also is it's known that there's far greater TCA risks from cork in Sardinia than any other country. It has to do with you know cork. Uh, the TCA is uh, trichloroanisole. It's a it's a particular chemical compound that's associated with cork taint. Um, it can be formed in the presence of, you know, certain anisoles and chlorine. Mm. And in this particular uh, part of the Mediterranean, there's a uh, higher chlorine content in the natural environment. And so we think that that has something to do with it. Oh. Um, so there's just different regions that do better for various, you know, kind of reasons. But the center of the cork production for stoppers is going to be Portugal, Spain. And it's kind of through that Extremadura region of Spain and um, South uh, uh, Portugal. That's the, that's the real heart of it. Yeah. I, you always, it, being, being from the United States, we always think we can do everything. Is, it, yeah. <clears throat> is there a reason we don't see any cork grown or tried to be grown in the United States or North America? Yeah. Yeah. It's mostly um, if, if for one, it's, it's far too uh, cost prohibitive. Uh, you know, California land is far too valuable. Um, and so to give you an idea, if I went out and I planted a cork tree, uh, it would take me 25 years before that cork tree would be mature enough to where I could strip its bark. Mm -hmm. And that first uh, stripping uh, is actually what they call the virgin cork uh, wood. And it's real gnarly looking. It doesn't have, you know, the it's not nice and smooth like uh, the, the more mature uh, bark is. And so that first bark, you could only grind and use in, in insulation type products or composites. So you need another nine years after that. So really 34 years before you have your first harvest and then nine years there every, every, you know, thereafter. And so it's just far too cost prohibitive. It comes from Portugal because it was native to the Mediterranean yeah. and that's where it originated from. So in Portugal, land uh, is far cheaper than, than places the, like in the United States. So, so I think, you know, there are some, uh, what have been, what we've been told as being native uh, trees uh, around that just somehow have gotten here. Uh, but uh, the vast majority of any cork tree you see in California is, uh, has been planted. Yeah. I, I have a, on my, at my home, I have uh, a few of them and it was really just by chance uh, that I, you know, was coming to view the home and, and uh, I looked up when I got to the gate and said, Oh my God, that's a cork tree. And so is that, so is that. So I have three. Of them. Like, that's an <laughs> omen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So you're, so right, says it's a sign. <laughs> only nine, nine years away from your first virgin harvest. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's amazing. That's funny. Um, so I heard, I heard, heard through the grapevine that you've made the leap from the supply side to the production side, and are now running wine or have your own winery operation going. A little wine brand, yeah. So um, we, you know, I've been a huge uh, a wine lover for years. Uh, mm -hmm. we're, you know, extremely passionate about the product and 
I've always uh, really, you know, uh, like to say kind of geeked out on, on wine and how it's made and, and so forth. So uh, we, uh, we acquired a vineyard uh, some years ago and, and it was kind of like our, our intention of someday uh, mm-hmm. making wine. And so, um, you know, the stars aligned and, and uh, we said, well, let's just do it. And we, we kind of embarked on that journey a little sooner than we anticipated. Thought it was more of a retirement project, but uh, mm-hmm. it's uh, it's become a, a you know a real thing. So yeah, so we we harvested uh, this year all all the grapes for for our own ge- deal and uh, cabernet, and um, yeah, so so it's fun. We're we're enjoying it and uh, look forward to uh, to getting on that side of the fence when it comes time to get get wine in market. That's awesome. So this is your fir- first harvest and first um, first vinting. The, exactly this year so the 22 which we had some challenges uh, we had to uh, you know some a great growing season happening and then all of a sudden we got that extreme heat wave come oh, labor day it was yeah. really crazy so we had 118 uh three different days in the vineyard um and but you know we weathered the the heat okay and we brought it in before the the rain which was good so that rain kind of threw a wrench in things too so what became a uh or what was you know Coming into being a really good, you know, year uh, was is now probably going to be considered a, a little bit of a difficult year and a winemaker's year. So, yeah, um, well, uh, we think we have something pretty special, uh, you know, going down to barrel soon. So, and can you can you tell us the name of the brand? It'll be my family name, so it'll be Mo. Um, yeah, so Mo so family. we're Mo Napa Valley, and uh, our goal is to do. Uh, single vineyard Cabernet. We have a, a vineyard, as I said, that uh, is Cabernet, and it will do you know a few hundred cases from our vineyard, uh, and then in a couple of years we'll do a few hundred cases from another vineyard of a, a region that we really really love, you know, Pritchard Hill. So and then oh, yeah. you know expand upon that as well after that, and probably do a few hundred cases from you know one of the Valley Four sites, Rutherford, Oakville, something like that. So kind of just. Taking what we love and and mm-hmm. you know, along with our estate, you know, taking what we love and and really just trying to do a few single vineyards, um, you know, Cabernet blends. So, how is it? How, what's it like being on the um, the creation side versus the supply side? Yeah, I mean, well, <laughs> first first finish. I, uh, yeah, I mean, I've uh, we've been dealing, you know, uh, as a you kind of segued in when we started i've been doing this a long time so i've seen so many different winemakers across my career and um i think what it did is it you know when i first started seeing harvest happening and i was on that on you know on the the vintner side Mm -hmm. uh, i was just like wow i mean i went to the guy uh, the winemaker at where we make it and i was like man i just have a whole new level of respect for you because you know this is uh today was just an absolute you know shit show and you Um, you (laughs) you look like you know, you're barely bothered you know and so excuse the french but oh yeah um and he just kind of chuckled and uh you know this is what they do and so it's just really i mean the the juggling the you know all the grapes coming in at once this year because of that heat um you know accelerated everything so just whole new level of respect for these guys and uh, you know because i've been a wine lover for so long i really really let that translate into how we uh, how we provide cork to customers. I mean, we're, I'm, I'm a little bit of a control freak. So, you know, I'm, we're over 50 people in the company and I'm still out on the factory floor every day, looking over the orders that I say, no, no, uh, uh, you know, none of our uh, customers, uh, you know, and especially on the luxury side, their order never leaves without it seeing my eyes. So I'm always looking, always making sure things are, uh, to my standard and, uh, our standard. And so, being like that uh because uh, these are wines i love and i don't want to open up bottles and having issues and or having customers complaining and so uh just uh i've saw a lot of winemakers be very very meticulous and so on and then now being on that thinner side as i said you know i, I kind of translated that over to that side and i was like gosh you know I, i'm I, I would be a tough customer <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> good thing i'm going to uh have a little a little in there on the cork side so absolutely yeah, i'm sure it- being uh, uh, that would be a huge level up though to have so much experience on the supply side like knowing how yeah. to source this material what is yeah. a what's one thing about the um starting this new wine operation that um if you had to do it over again you would change you know i think um 
it's has started out really well. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm, I would say if I could do it over again and be the, that heat that hit us Labor Day uh. weekend, because we were having a fantastic growing season. Um, but, you know, I, I'm learning a lot every day, every, you know, uh, we've, you know, I'm very uh, heavily involved in the vineyard side. That's where I spend my evenings and weekends. I absolutely love it. Um, you know, if I was to, um, you know, start, uh, you know, if I was to not be in, in uh, where I'm at today with my primary job uh, running a cork business, uh, mm -hmm. I definitely would be, would, I would have gone back to school to become a winemaker and, and taken that, you know, as my career. So yeah, I absolutely that's, love it. That loving it, that's a question I ask quite a bit is, now, what is it that you love about the wine industry? What What's kept you in the game for so long? You know what? These people are so passionate about what they do. I mean, that's, you know, I always say what has kept me in this this game for so long is, you know, yeah, I, you know, I'm I'm the CEO. I, I take care of, I have full, you know, oversight of this, this business and it's a sizable business. And, but I never lose touch with the customer. I'm at least one, if not two days a week out having lunch with a customer interacting with the customer a lot of them have become dear friends of mine mm -hmm. uh you know so so i just i i think that this industry has created such amazing uh people and i've had some amazing friendships as a result that uh really just comes down to the passion that these people have i mean once in a while i'll run into a, a guy who you know says yeah you know, i think this is gonna be my last harvest i'm kind of losing my you know passion for it mm -hmm. and i'm on day you know, i'm on day 22 straight you know because it's harvest season uh, I had somebody tell me that the other day, but um, I think for the most part, what I love about it is just that, you know, people, people really uh, love that creative side, mm -hmm. the, the making of something grapes to glass, I think is, is, is fun. It's a, it's really fun. And that's, I, I think that's, a, you've hit the nail on the head and that's some of the, the same thing that's kept me passionate about the industry for so long. And also the fact that it's still a conversation. It's still a, um, it's not maybe done a little more than a handshake now, but it's still a lot yeah. of that just personal referrals and connections. Yeah. And as I always say to people um, jokingly that because some people will knock Napa, you know, it's been in the news a lot lately for, you know, costs going up, can't mm -hmm. get a hotel under a thousand bucks a night and that sort of thing, which is disappointing. Uh, but, uh, you know, when you're involved in the industry and for instance, Napa, it's still a good old boys network. I mean, it's still like there's still farmers on the ground that have been doing it for 30 years in this valley. And there's still a young winemaker coming up. Mm -hmm. I mean, you got, you know, a lot of guys in this valley that are in that, you know, uh, 30 to 45 year old range that are really doing it. And mm -hmm. they are extremely passionate about what they're doing. And they're sharp. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're there. There's, you know, I think, uh, you know, there's uh, one thing that this industry has is, you know, is is. There's a lot of really talented people uh, that are extremely passionate about what they're what they're doing, and that just makes it exciting. There, there is there's there's so many talented people, and it's such a competitive industry. What advice would you give someone that's you know maybe graduating from college and trying to get their foothold in the industry? You know, I think that um, you know really uh, what it comes down to is a lot of people think they need to uh, gain that experience. They need to um you know go work in the tasting room and work their way up and you know this type of thing and what i really say is the the wine stuff can be taught mm -hmm. what is lacking in today's society is young people that want to put in the work mm -hmm. i see uh, a lot of young people coming out of college today that that think it's you know working four days a week is okay uh you know not you know, one, yeah well <laughs> Just <laughs> wanting <laughs> wanting to come in at nine and leave at two thirty, uh, taking off every other Friday or Monday. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, it, I just, I really, I mean, I got to where I am today because, you know, I was the first guy in and the last guy to leave for a lot of years, and I wasn't just there in presence. I was there trying to make things happen and move the business forward. And so, I really think that uh, the work ethic is what I try to, you know, really promote to people. Mm -hmm. His work ethic will be noticed. And uh, a lot of the, um, you know, a lot of what I see today is a lack of, of work ethic in the young people. So, uh, so that's, that's my, my kind of first and foremost that I tell people. I hire people uh, based upon what I see in them and what, you know, I think 
uh, how driven they are and that sort of thing. I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, degrees are important, uh, but not the end all be all. Um, mm -hmm. I think that, uh, having the experience of the industry is, is, is important, but not the end all be all. I don't necessarily have to hire somebody with wine experience. Yeah. And that makes entire sense because wine's the medium, but what you're really looking for is like passion and excellence. Absolutely. Cause you, you can, hit it right there. Yeah. It's a, and I think a lot of people forget that they go out mm -hmm. on a wine weekend and they're like, this is great. Yeah. I want to work in this business. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. A, it is a lot of hard work on both sides. Is he speaking about hard work going forward? Um, where do you, where do you see the um, closure industry going over the next like six seven years? Yeah, I think. Uh, I mean, so Cork is is doing right, very right, well. Cycles, so that was probably a bad. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Good die's already been cast. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, Cork has been on a, a huge comeback. As I told you, you know, we went down to you know probably in the might have dipped into the fifty percentile, fifty eight, fifty nine, but I, I usually say sixty percentile of market share, and uh, we feel like we're up well over the seventy percent mark. Uh, nowadays, I think that you have, um, well, and you know, the, the, there's still some, uh, synthetic stoppers being purchased and it's primarily due to price. I think that when those wineries see that, uh, they can buy a court closure that can be cost competitive mm -hmm. and they see that, that, that pricing can, can be somewhat, you know, flat and not be so tied to exchange mm -hmm. rates that are volatile. I think that those guys will come over. Um, it looks like, uh, that rosés and Sauvignon Blanc and, and some of the early white wine or, you know, light white wines, fast mm -hmm. rotation, uh, people are okay with screw caps. So mm -hmm. it's going to have its place. We see bag in the box and, and some of those, uh, single use, uh, even wine in the can or keg, uh, mm -hmm. we see that, you know, it's going to have a, a share of the market. Uh, but we feel like something that has happened in the U.S. is has been a very traditional market. Tr the U.S. consumer, and we've done a lot of work with various customers where they've done focus group work, uh, and customers associate a higher quality product with a cork stopper. So mm -hmm. if you're going to go to the store and you're going to buy a $10 bottle of wine, you're, you are going to gravitate to the same package, but one is a cork and one is a screw cat. You're going gravi to gravitate to the cork. Yeah. Now, if you come above, say, that $20 price point, you will never grab the screw cap. You're always going to grab the cork if you have the same. So it's like we've seen these tendencies. What cork has done is given headaches to wineries over the years. Yeah. Today, cork is not giving headaches to wineries. So if we give them the option of having a cork versus an alternative, and the cork isn't going to give them the headache, they're going to choose cork every time, as long as it's cost competitive. With our streamlines processes that we've we've implemented in Portugal and manufacturing excellence, we've uh, we, we've we've really been able to uh, be cost competitive, and and so we see uh, Cork continuing to maintain its uh, its its superior market share, and we see it in other markets. I mean, you, I I was in Germany recently and uh, absolutely love uh, Mosel Rieslings and so oh, yeah. on. Germany, these these guys uh, are all screw cap, but they're top wines. So if you look at any of their, their, uh, you know, Grand Cru uh, level, uh, uh, wines, all of them have cork. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so they believe that cork is superior for, for long-term aging and so forth. Mm -hmm. So, um, we think that that sooner or later will kind of continue to trickle down. Um, and markets like that, we've seen Australia, all the top highest end wines are all in cork and New Zealand. These are, these are huge mainstays for screw caps and um, we see cork making comebacks there and you know like for australia one of their big markets was china mm. china is a, is a fan of traditional packaging they do not want to see they do not want to go to the supermarket or wherever they buy their wines and see a critter on the label they will not uh -huh. buy it. Uh -huh. they want to see a, a you know a, a picture of a of a chateau or something like oh, that yeah. with a capsule and a cork mm -hmm. and so the chinese market has really helped the cork industry as well so so we see, this is a long-winded answer, but we see uh, cork uh, remaining uh, in a majority position, but we see those alternatives such as screw cap uh, or bag in the box, cans, those sort of things, uh, they will have a share for sure. Yeah, and, they, and, it, and the, so on the lower price point that there's work or can compete, but a lot of the share that they're taking over, maybe is not the best use for cork anyways, like if you're doing kegs in a, in a bar. It's Absolutely. Really yeah. facilitate the fact that you, 
versus opening up five cases of wine a night. Yeah, yeah. And we see, we've seen that for a long time. And it's actually, frankly, you know, when we have discussions with, uh, with our uh, uh, board in Portugal, uh, we kind of chuckle that it, it took so long for people to, to come on to, to, for instance, the bag in the box. Mm-hmm. If you go to Northern Europe and you're in a restaurant and you buy a glass of wine, mm-hmm. they don't bring, bring out a bottle and pour a glass. They go to the back of the, in, into the kitchen and they uh-huh. pull out the bag in the box, spick it, and they fill a glass. Oh, yeah. So it's so all over Northern Europe. They've been using these uh, for years. Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Now, I want to jump to the upper end. Now, we're getting towards the end, but I, Okay. Yeah. So as far as ageability, cork undoubtedly is the, the closure if you want to lay your wines down for a long time, but eventually it does start to degrade. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's just a part of the natural. Has there been, um, for lack of a better word, technological improvements in like the upper end corks that allow them like a greater ageability? Yeah. I mean, the biggest correlation to ageability of the stopper is, is uh, storage conditions. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. if we, if we put, uh, wine, under a stopper and we put it into a, a condition that is is you know a, a, is good storage condition meaning you know above 50 percent humidity uh you know temperatures are below 70 let's say you know uh it, it's going to live a very very long life and be uh, a, a very very good functioning stopper mm-hmm. the problem is is not all conditions are equal and so you have wines that have been subjected to various conditions that then uh, cr- create problems. So big thing is humidity, uh, mm-hmm. but then, you know, really it's uh, it's just overall storage conditions, heat, you know, uh, sunlight, you know, whatever. So, so you have, you know, uh, those, those things at play. I can't say there's anything that's really done to try to prolong the, the longevity. I mean, surface coatings are, are a huge part of how a stopper performs in the yeah. bottle. Mm-hmm. So we take a cork, and in order to make it um, go in and out of the bottle easily, you have to put a surface coating on it. But there's twofold to why you put the surface coating. So for high-end corks, we use a very special type of coating where we uh, we put this, um, it's almost like a solid paraffin wax on That's, the cork. Yeah. yeah, so we use we try to encapsulate the cork and create a little bit of a barrier between cork and bottleneck interface. Mm-hmm. And then we just put a light spray of silicone that gives it its slipperiness to go in and out of the bottle. So we have, uh, uh, for our highest end corks, we want to create that really tight seal, uh-huh. close off the, the porosity of the cork mm-hmm. by that paraffin and, uh, and therefore, you know, help it, uh, age longer. So some improvements with stuff with, with, for instance, what we know on surface coatings and how to apply it and so on. Really just tooling the processes. Yeah, it's something I've been curious about because I yeah age a lot of wines and they're all maybe that my humidity is not 50%, but they're definitely at 55 degrees. Yeah. And it is amazing to see after 10, 12 years the variation. And you can yeah. definitely tell a good cork when you pop when you pop open yeah. a 15-year-old bottle. And, it's and still you know, there's a there's a lot of things that go into bottling that, you know, a lot of times it, it gets pushed on to maybe the closure. But, you know, like when you bottle wine uh, and, you know, you've seen, I'm sure, on a bottling line and the bottles are going by and there's corks being shoved in them. Well, there's a there's a vacuum that happens. So the bottle goes up underneath the corker. It sucks out the air and the headspace and quickly a cork gets shoved into the bottle. If you are not pulling an adequate vacuum, you have positive pressure inside there. Uh, that pressure builds as soon as that wine gets even changes a few degrees of temperature. So you ship it across the country or whenever it leaves the winery, it's going to change uh, temperature and you're going to have some, some, you know, the wine is going to, to swell. And so therefore you're putting more pressure on the cork and it'll kind of, you know, that creates some issues. And so I always say like, there's, there's a lot of things that can go, you know, a little bit sideways with bottling and, a yeah, lot well, of people don't respect the headspace, you know. So I'm just going to mention that one of the biggest frustrations I ever had was selling Ravenu Chablis. They, you're selling three, four hundred dollar bottles of wine, and he puts zero headspace in there. Absolutely, that thing's so, weird. It's two degrees, it's going to blow. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know off the top of my head, uh, but it's like you know, I think it's like five five degree change. You move two millimeters or something like that. It's 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 crazy. So. Uh, why people would do that, I don't know, but uh, yeah, so there's a lot of issues. Yeah, I guess it doesn't want to be complaining, it didn't fill up high enough, yeah, exactly. And so, um, Dustin, as we're wrapping down here, I gotta 
I always kind of ask him this lately. How, how have you stayed motivated over the last 20, 30 years, 20 years? And how do you stay motivated? Yeah, you know, I, um, our business is very repetitive. So, you know, it's, uh, we have, we, we sell all 12 months out of the year. Some of our bigger customers bottle 12 months out of the year, but then with our uh, ultra premium or our premium ultra premium luxury, these guys are typically bottling, you know, spring, then right, then it, you know, whites, for instance, then right up at, uh, in June, July, right before harvest, they bottle the reds. They, sh- you know, get the space for, for the new vintage at the, in the winery. And, uh, so it's, you know, over the years you, you get, you know, customers that you've had forever, uh, you know, that, that call you every year in May or call you every year in April. And you know what, the, you know, so it's, uh, it's interesting. It's like, here we go again, you know? Uh-huh. Um, but I think that, you know, uh, the times in the industry right now, I, it's, it's a, it's a crazy time. You know, you, you think of how, uh, uh, where things have come from over the last, you know, five, 10 years and where they're at today. I think the business continues to be exciting. I think when it becomes not exciting is when you, you really struggle. And I think that, uh, as I've gotten older, my passion for the product has, uh, has, has, you know, become greater. And, uh, I do a lot of tastings. I organize a lot of tastings. I'm in tasting groups with various winemakers, various friends, you know, where we're, tasting stuff all the time. So I just, I really, really enjoy the product. Yeah. And so I think that that really kind of keeps me sucked in. And, and then now kind of embarking on the, this new venture with the, uh, with a small brand, it's also, I mean, for my primary business, obviously with Cork, it has kept me, you know, and lit a new fire. And so right. it's just, I think it has to do with just my passion for the business and the product. And, uh, and so, yeah, I don't, you know, my wife jokes and she says, you're never going to retire. And I say, probably not, you know, I'm, I might step down from, from my position, but I'll always be involved most likely with, uh, with the cork business and, and for certainly for the, with the wine business. Yeah, it's so, it's so special to be doing what you love. It just doesn't seem yeah. like work. Yeah. Yeah. I know. And that just, you just hit it. I mean, it, like I said, in, in parts of what, where we were discussed it is I just, I think it comes down to you're dealing with just wonderful people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So Dustin, where can people find out about, more about you and um, Porticor? Yeah. So uh, on the web, we're available uh, at uh, portacork.com. It's www.portacork.com. Uh, we, we receive people all the time. Uh, you know, when it's just consumers, uh, sometimes we can get really busy and uh, you know, we, our schedules don't, uh, align, but we do, uh, receive people at times, you know, that are just general consumers. So somebody comes to Napa and wants to learn about cork, they can by all means look us up and try to book something, but anybody in the business, uh, we're ready to receive you. I think it's a very, very interesting product. A lot of people, uh, are usually amazed if they come and spend an hour with us at our, our facility, just right in the South Napa business park. So, yeah, I'm going to have to stop by next time I'm up there. You need to, for sure. Love to see you. I would love to come up there. So, Dustin, thank you so much for joining us today. Yes. Thanks for having me. And, uh, yeah, we'll do it again in person, maybe. Absolutely. Talk to you later, Dustin. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Legends Behind the Craft podcast. We'll see you again next time. And be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes. (laughs) 